Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where this evening we have the unique opportunity to visit with a person who works around the world. We're going to be interested to see how many countries she's actually visited and worked in. But it's a company called Catalyst. It's a nonprofit organization that helps organizations provide better workplaces for women. And it's a very timely topic, I think, because it's something that we're talking about across the United States. In fact, Catalyst got its original beginning. It is an American company with a European arm, so to speak. So my guest this evening is Allison Zimmerman, who is the executive director of the Europe model of Catalyst, or model is not, probably not the right word, but of the organization. Yeah. Welcome to Minnesota. I know you are a native <laughs> Minnesotan. Yes, I am. And so we can let people know that. But uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come into to the area and do the show and then you're gotten out here long and you're back on the plane yeah. been heading back to your home which is Zurich Switzerland exactly and what is the temperature running in this time of the year in Zurich <laughs> it's not as cold as it is definitely <laughs> here um, it's much warmer it's it's probably 20 degrees warmer wow. I think yeah wow but thank well, you for having me tell us a little bit about first of all what catalyst is and it is and as I mentioned in the opening it's been around since 1962, so it's been here a long time. But I know you work with really large corporations. Exactly. I think I read on your website companies totaling over a trillion and a half dollars in revenue, which is an incredible amount of money. Absolutely. It's, um, so Catalyst is a research and advisory organization, and our focus is, is largely on gender equality. Um, but we've been around since 1962. It was a woman in the US who opened it. And she really wanted to bring to the country um, the needs of having more women in the workforce. And, um, and so we're largely known for the research around what are the myths about women in the workplace? Why aren't women advancing? But we're also focused on the solutions. It's, it's not enough to know that there's a challenge, we all know that, but how do you shift and create impact, especially in a corporation, but also in a government? And so we and are- And you do work with governments too, We do, you? we do. We've been asked um, by various governments, um, they, they ask us to come in as a thought leader because of the sound research we do, but they also um, want advice so we, we have isolated incidences. I remember I oversee our European arm and we were brought into France for, um, for a discussion. So we're often tapped into for the knowledge, um, but more importantly as well, it, even with the European Commission, we've given advice on what to do going forward um, for the next five years. And so, um, this is something um, that, while well, I would say our wheelhouse is largely corporations, it trickles into other um, arenas as well. I know, just as an aside, this is yeah. not the most um, seen TV show you've been on because you said you were <laughs> on the BBC yeah. with how many viewers worldwide on that? It was um, 300 million. 300 million viewers. That's yeah. a little bit bigger than we well, are. Well, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Let's send this out. So <laughs> to make a distinction, you don't focus so much, you don't focus on harassment issues as much as barriers to providing opportunities for women yeah. to grow. So how, roughly how many countries do you think you've personally worked in? How I, well, well so Europe, you know, it's not the United States of Europe, so we have, you know, ranging 24 to 27 countries. Um, I personally have worked um, with catalysts across Europe, from Slovenia to Sweden. 
so that means um, it doesn't mean that the bulk that I'm always in in every country but I've lived in four countries across Europe Germany Austria Switzerland and Scotland and um, but I also um, now live in Switzerland again and yeah so, so we cover a lot. You're dealing with really significantly different cultures. Yeah. Not only the governmental culture mm -hmm. structure, but companies. And you said a lot of the big companies you work with are family-owned businesses. Oh, actually, no, that was Slovenia when we oh, were okay, talking in previously. That country. Okay. Um, some of the countries like in Eastern Europe are more family-owned. The corporations that we work with are large, large multinational corporations. So if you think of the big names like Procter & Gamble, um, in, in Europe, UBS, Barclays, you think of these big companies. Those are the ones we work primarily with, the large cap. Um, but the impact, the reason why we do is because they're all struggling. While, while the con countries definitely add in a context that is different, what's fascinating is they're all struggling with the same issues. It's globally, and we're a global nonprofit. And so whether we're in Japan all the way to the US, there's vast differences in those countries, obviously, India and um, Canada. But the reality is those issues can really come down to um, key, key themes that we see, uh, particularly around advancing women. And so when I look at, um, I'll give an example, um, unconscious bias. One of the reasons, one of the barriers of why women aren't advancing is they're always running against this unconscious bias. Um, the biggest bias is think leader, think male. And that is universal. We see that. All you have to do is look at the numbers globally. In the United States alone, 95% of the Fortune 500 company CEOs are men. Wow. And how long have we been doing this work, looking at gender equality? So there's this perception that because we're talking about it, or because it's been there for a long time, or because you go into a workplace and you see women everywhere, that you think, well, it's not so bad. And we, uh, our point of view is, yes, advances have, have happened since the 1960s, absolutely. And we wanna celebrate that. But the fact that of the top corporations you have of leadership, of the CEO, you only have 5% women in one of the most advanced countries in the world, that, that should be shocking. Uh, to many people. You know, I think one of the perceptions that people have when I've worked in the world of the corporations is that when women do get to the top, they're ruthless. No. You don't ever hear, hear that, that a lot. much about when men get to the top. Yeah. But I mean, there's that perception that if a woman has had the skills to get to the top, and there are some large corporations yeah. now with women in leadership roles, uh, that's got to be a, a real barrier too, doesn't it? It's absolutely because, okay, what you have at the top is what you'll continue to get. So if you have a dominant style that is ruthless and you have a dominant style that's being rewarded and being expected, that's what you're going to continue to get. So you have to change the top to change what you're demanding the talent looks like. And it goes back, you know, when I said think leader, think male, it could be think leader, think assertive or ruthless, or this, um, something very maybe dominant uh, behavior. Um, the problem with that is when you look at gender, even if women, um, let's, let me say it differently, assertiveness, let's say that's valued. Assertiveness can be admired in men, but hated in women. And we see that all you have to do is turn on the news, turn on any show, mm -hmm. you will see that, that double standard. So what we did is we did research called um, Double Bind, Damned If You Do, Doomed If You Don't. And what we found, and it's still relevant today, is that when women behave in ways that are stereotypically considered feminine, they're often seen as being too soft to be a leader. If they behave in ways that are not stereotypically feminine, that might be rougher or tougher, 
they actually are seen as being too masculine, too tough, or ruthless. And this, this double bind is kind of like you can't be too, too soft or too tough. You have to kind of find this middle ground in order to be respected. So the way I often describe it is women often have to walk a tightrope and how they are being perceived, whether either being respected or being liked. Men, by and large, have a larger margin of error with how they can behave. So that assertiveness is on the spectrum much broader in terms of how it's being received by those um, perceiving it. It's interesting, Maybe isn't it, positive. that in Great Britain and Germany, uh, mm -hmm. Theresa May and Merkel are, are women leaders in countries that you would think that culture would be resistant to electing women leaders, but they've, they've overcome that obstacle, haven't yeah. they? Yeah, and, and well, you know, there's still challenges oh, right sure. now, obviously. I wouldn't say they've overcome I mean, did you did you see? Well, to be elected, I meant. Yeah. At least to become yeah, elected. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So they definitely, <laughs> when you see that, um, the fact. I mean, many countries have had women um, at the most senior levels being elected. South American countries. Yeah, have, South yeah. American. Um, it, it would be nice when it's no longer something we have to highlight and 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 discuss. You know that it's just normal. We our point of view is let's get beyond the first the first you know, female chancellor, the first prime minister. Um, but also let's look at how are we judging the women? We are holding them often to these higher standards than men in the workplace, but we can see it in government, we can see it in other ways. Um, one of our research, uh, we've been tracking 10,000 MBA graduates to see men and women alike, to test out some myths, why women aren't advancing and why they, why they are and what, what they're doing to do that and what not. And what we found is that one of the studies we looked at on the myth of the ideal worker is that women must prove performance. They are promoted based on that proven performance, whereas men are promoted based on potential. Hmm. So how we evaluate talent is, is really rooted deep down into you know, does she have what? It, does she have enough experience? Less likely to take a risk on a man who they might perceive has that experience, or they look for mm. the potential. So there are a lot of there are various barriers, but this is one of the biases I run into the most. So when you work with a large company, and if mm -hmm. the large company asks your organization to come in. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you get to work with the boards? Because I would guess that it's the boards yeah. that really are the decision maker to get that person yeah. to that next level. Are, are those boards usually receptive to what you have to say? Oh, that's, that's a good question. They are. And what's interesting, by the time we are coming in to that board, they're usually, the board is much more open to this than the layer below really? or the layers below. The reason being, there, there are many reasons for that, I guess. Um, one of the things that we have noticed is when, you know, oftentimes what engages, well, let me say it differently, the boards are largely made up of men. That's a given. That's not a stereotype. We see it across the board that, you know, they're largely, uh, usually one or two women are on the boards globally. But what we know is what engages, what blocks men from engaging, now I'm talking about the middle level, it's not the board, is this fear. This fear of if I help her advance or if I, if I you know, support gender equality, somehow I'm gonna lose out. It's almost like they see it as a pie. And when, and it's not a pie, because it's kind of like if I take one piece out and a woman gets that piece, what will happen to me? Well, who said that was your piece of pie to begin with? But what the challenge is, if you want to think about it a pie, companies have to think about the pie ever expanding. That the more women and the more diverse women, not only women, but white women, women of color that we have, it, it is directly tied to better performance of a corporation. So the boards, coming back to your question, 
the boards get that. They usually get that much earlier than before we come in. The challenge is, and this happened, um, I won't say what country in Europe, but I was invited to sit with the CEO and the board and to sit there and do kind of a session on unconscious bias to find out what is going on. And they had some real ahas and it was a really powerful session at how open they were with why they were cautious about the topic. But they were much more open to it than the level below. So I also had a session with the levels mm. below, um, largely male. Um, and that's where the resistance whoa. is, isn't it? I thought it was going to be tarnished and thrown out of the room. I mean, it was, but once they understood that this is not about giving anybody a hand up, this is just about looking beyond the usual suspects of who you deem as being the best talent. So one example I would use with that group of leaders is I would say, okay, you know, let's say you're in the group, Ray, Ray, we have a group of a hundred people here in the room. You and I are gonna create a super all-star team. You get to choose from the whole room, your all-star team. And I get to choose from half the room. Who's gonna have the best team? Mm. You are. Because you are looking broader and wider. That is all, that is not all, but that is what we're asking companies to do is look beyond the usual suspects stop picking people like you it's unconscious it doesn't mean even if you're really intentional and very supportive of this you need to have other mechanisms mechanisms in place to ensure that your unconscious bias isn't coming in and filtering through um, your decision making the heart of it is you cannot possibly believe that you have the best talent and ultimately are super innovative if they all look and think like you because to serve the market you need to look you diversity. need you need that diversity you cannot it, it, and so the board they get that mm -hmm. they know the, the way the status quo is right now it is not sustainable for their business so if a company a large company asks your organization mm -hmm. to come in and you show the research and you show the barriers that people have, what's the next step that most of these companies do? Do they still work with you or do they connect to someone else that does training for this or what's yeah. the next stage? Well, the stage is the solutions. So while we, while we are known for our research and our content and knowledge, we also have the solutions that we've learned from working with over you know, 800 large corporations. And, and really seeing not only what worked, but what sometimes you learn a lot more from what hasn't mm -hmm. worked. There is not a one size fits all. Oftentimes, so going to your question, the solution would be looking at where is your biggest pain point? Where's your biggest challenge? Um, awareness is only a small part of it. In this day and age, it's really got to be, yes, we're going to be aware there's a challenge and that's the foundation, but how do you create change? You create change in a number of ways. Absolutely, one example I shared already, work with leaders. Abs you need leaders to understand that this is in their best interest, in the company's best interest, that progress for women is progress for everyone. On the other hand, um, it may be that there's that pocket of resistance that you really need to work with. And one thing that we've been doing that across globally that was really, um, I, 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 it doesn't sound humble, but I would say it's very cutting edge because it's not, not a lot are doing this at the moment, but we do engaging men workshops where we work with men directly. That middle layer, mm -hmm. that resistance, um, in Europe, they call it the marzipan layer, um, which I think can be derogatory because it makes it sound negative, but it's that, it's that layer that really um, you need to engage. And so for years of uh, you know, companies looking at this topic, they were unconsciously looking at women. Okay, women, we need to fix the women. Um, women need to become more confident, more assertive. You need to do this. It's the wrong way to go about it. 
You need to focus on the system, fix the workplace, so that not only women can benefit, but men too. So when we do Engaging Men workshops, it's called MARC, M-A-R-C. It stands for Men Advocating for Real Change. And we have had big CEOs go through it, such as Michael Dell from Dell um, went through it. Dell has done a lot. Procter & Gamble has done a lot on it, as have other companies. But what they do is they go through this really experiential workshop. No PowerPoint. Maybe there's a PowerPoint, but not, not much on it. Um, really, for them to experience what it means first, to feel like the other, to feel like the oddball, because many men don't feel like they belong to that dominant group. But the next layer is seeing the unconscious bias that's happening, how the workplaces are being experienced by women versus men. Um, and, and then finally, really, um, this is the kicker for many, is understanding that they have a privilege and the most men you ask them, if I asked you, Ray, what's your privilege? You might be able to list, maybe, I mean, you're more self-aware, maybe you, 10, but most people can list maybe three privileges that they might have, or five, most men. When they go through this workshop, they really experience their privilege. And that, for the leaders, is the biggest shock. Hmm. And, it, and they go home to their families and their partners or their children, and they have conversations. It's like, do you really need to think, do you think about this? You know, do you worry about your safety, where you park? Do you, you know, things you never think about, they never maybe think about. Um, it kind of opens a door. And then the, it's a bit shocking in a positive way, but it, it, it I guess the heart of the most effective kind of workshop with the mark is that you have awareness and a lot of companies want to go awareness to action. But if you don't get that acceptance piece, mm -hmm. the heart of what it's really about, you're not going to make change. Yeah. So it's really getting at the heart of it. Uh, obviously there are some significant differences between working with the leadership in companies, corporations, and governments. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm interested to know what kind of governments <laughs> have approached your organization. I, I, I know some governments that should, yeah, but I, I don't know. think they um, are. <laughs> so we can't, I can't share any, any company names. Sure. I can't share, other than the ones that have gone public. I shared Dell and Procter and & Gamble, only because they've talked publicly in certain ways about Mark, but um, there was, I can say that there was a European government agency. Um, that's the most I can say. Um, it is different because uh, we, I remember, you know, you have to have thick skin sometimes <laughs> with this topic because when you tap into fairness, people feel, oh, it's unfair. No, it's not about, it, it is really, it is about fairness, but it's really much more than that. And what happened with the government, I remember going in, I, we, we didn't even talk about gender. We talked about inclusive leadership, how to get the most out of a diverse group. Long story short, there were a row of hecklers in the back of the room. Hecklers? Hecklers. Never had hecklers in my life before. I <laughs> do a lot of speaking and a, a row of hecklers. And they were very angry. At you? I never talked about women. I talked about inclusive leadership. They were angry about the topic. And I remember during a break going, what's going on? And I found out governments are different. They usually have quotas. They usually have that. So for them, it was all about the quota. And we don't take the position the that quota there's meaning the quota, of like women. you need to have another number of women and you okay. need to have another. <clears throat> right. So it was in their eyes, very much a token way of thinking. And then I understood it. The heart of the pushback there is men don't want to be left out. And the opposite, women push back too. Women don't want to be singled out. Women won't, don't want to be seen as a token. Who does? Nobody does. 
But rarely do we ask ourselves when that man got that job or that new CEO that he was a token. We often assume it's a woman. So the government, the, the often it becomes political and it often becomes, it's so tied to, is it this, is it about politics or is it about this? No, this is really about good business and this is about um, creating a better workplace so that women can succeed, but men can succeed and businesses can succeed. So one of your big challenges is to go into these organizations in mm -hmm. a non-threatening way yes. to get this information to people, isn't it? Yeah. I can see that's well, what a is, challenge. Well, what <clears throat> inspires people is not feeling shamed and blamed. You've got to come in into it. and and. The work, especially with engaging the dominant group, men are part of the solution. They, we can't make them be the problem. Right. That's not, that's not the solution. But they have, they're making up the upper echelons, so they have a lot of power to create change. We are almost out of time. Okay. But if you could tell us, how would someone get information? I know you have a website, yeah. and I think you also have information on the things you do on that website uh, in video format, do yeah, you Yeah, many. We have online trainings for free. You don't have to be a member of Catalyst. The website is www.catalyst.org. And, um, and Catalyst, or just Google Catalyst, um, and so you'll find our website. And you are international, mm -hmm. but it is a headquarter technically in America. In it America. Is in New York City. Yeah. And your executive, your director is a woman? Yeah, yeah. Executive, our CEO is a woman. And, um, and we, have, um, we have boards made of CEOs. Our BOD is a board of CEOs of the biggest corporations. So if you look, if you go to Catalyst, you will see a list of all the CEOs that yeah. are on the board. Very Pretty interesting powerful. topic, very timely. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to jump on board with us. Yeah. Really appreciate it, Allison. Great, thank you for having me, you thank bet. you. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time. <laughs>